unfortunately. There are probably people in this room that know someone on a personal level that suffers from this. Um, and again, a lot of it, it's important to know this, you know, there's always things we can't change by ourselves, whether we've got dealt some bad cards, genetics, whatever. But the majority of this that we see, it's lifestyle. It is smoking, sedentary lifestyle, uh, high fatty foods, bad diet, not exercising, you know, all the things that we love to do, unfortunately. Uh, well, that's true, you know, we, it's fun to eat bad food. Um, or I don't like it. Um, so that is why we see a lot of it, particularly here in Oklahoma, because we are high for a lot of really bad things, high blood pressure, diabetes, those types of things. Uh, it's important to note risk factors for this because those are things that can absolutely be changed. So the treatment of this disease, first and foremost, unless it's so far gone you have to be surgically managed, it's lifestyle changes, which actually kind of sucks for a PA because those are the things that you sit there and fight with patients about the most. Because no one wants to go to die, we quit smoking, and we lose the weight, we don't exercise. So you're like, ugh, this one's hard. Um, but anyway, so basic description, definition of it, um, peripheral arterial disease, a manifestation of systemic atherosclerosis. sclerosis, so you know, that fatty, plaquey buildup, um, in which there is partial or total blockage in the arteries, um, exclusive of the coronary <coughs> or cerebral vessels. So, kind of like arterial insufficiency, where I was like, it can be anywhere, it depends on where it's at, where it presents. Peripheral arterial disease is not like that, in that it does not include the heart, and it does not include the brain. This is pretty much the lower extremities. How many people in here, by show of hands, know somebody on a personal level that has peripheral artery disease? Or you think they probably do, they just don't know it. Yeah. My dad has it. My dad has it. <clears throat> and he definitely has arterial, it's not venous, it's definitely arterial. So, peripheral arterial disease is defined as a resting ABI of less than 0 0.90. And if you go back up to that slide, there's a little numerical doohickey on the side of it that gives you values of normal, borderline, abnormal. So basically remember, 0 0.90 and lower than that, so 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.9, blah, 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 not good. You should be going up in that number, not down. So 0.9, if you were to calculate, and I can go over how to calculate, it's really easy. If you were to get a 0 0.9, 0 0.80, that's PAB. That's why it's a good thing to learn how to do because it takes no time to do it. You can do it in your office and have a pretty good feel that that's what's going on with you. <clears throat> Epidemiology, um, you know, this one is not as cool or pathognomonic like uh, giant cell arteritis, because there are a lot of folks that can have atherosclerotic changes. If you took half the people, in, or took everybody in this room, they're probably with them. <laughs> already has some sort of development of atherosclerosis. Um, it just happens. Um, now granted, you're not hopefully going to see a 30-year-old with severe PAD, but uh, I mean, 40 years old, that's, that's young. I feel like it is, it's, it's, I'm knocking on that door. <laughs> uh, so 40 and up. Uh, males, this is more common in males, but women can have it as well. But men are more, it's more common in men. Um, you can read all that. It's it's huge. That 8 to 12 million, I know you're like, eh, that's a lot of stinking people. And that's actually probably changed just by me giving this lecture. It's probably went up a couple. Just <laughs> it's a huge problem. Risk factors. These are risk factors that you've probably already been introduced to, at least in your MI or your myocardial infarction lecture. Um, things that you already know. Um, diabetes, that's what DM stands for, I apologize. Obviously cigarette smoking, obesity, hypertension, hypertension, 
Um, raise, that book, where that going to go Read those. Now, some of those things you can change. Some of those things you can't change. Um, even the sticks. As much as you want to go get whatever cut off or put on, you still can't change that underlying thing genetically. So, um, those are things that, you know, you try to, that's just there. But the risk factors you can't change and what you try to focus on. Pathophysiology, um, I'm not going to go over this. You can read it on your own. Essentially, it's what I've already kind of told you and what you somewhat learned in your uh, myocardial infarction lecture. You have an artery. Plaque starts to build up. It can be stable, and then all of a sudden it's not stable. It ruptures. Um, and I think the next slide has that, basically. So when that... Uh, cap ruptures, it's sticking out there. Blood flow's going by. Well, all those little components of blood flow, platelets, fibrin, all those little things start to collect on it. But it's all sticky. And over time, it just builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up, and it just cuts off blood. Kind of the same thing that happens with the MI, the blood part of that. <coughs> but you can read that. Let me think here if there's anything. Did they give you the pathophysiology at some lecture about plaque formation? It's stable, it ruptures. And if you, you know, peripheral, peripheral, that's what it means, PAD. It's in the periphery. That's what we're talking about. And honestly, that, this right here kind of says it all, right? I mean, I guess if you had to sum up this lecture from PAD, sum of it in that arterial insufficiency slides, but this one, that basically sums it all up. That's what is going on. You have atherosclerosis. This wall or this glomus forms, you cut off blood, it becomes a skin. Get pain, and then there's impairment from that because anything that has blood flow cut off to it long enough is not going to work the correct way, right? The heart, the brain, anything. Uh, now, know this that, and I don't think I have this in here. I'm sure if you went and pulled out a book or read, you could, it might be on there for percentages. Obviously, some places are more, kind of like the triple artery thing, some places are more common than others. Um, but that's a kind of Okay, it kind of shows you the different areas that are more common, like the frequency of involvement. So you can go down that and look at the different ones. But I mean, look at that. Those are all the main, I mean, there are tiny little ones that aren't there, but that's the main arteries that could potentially be affected. Um, so again, knowing your anatomy, knowing your placement of where you're at is important. Now, granted, again, like, a lot of things in medicine. You're going to go get the test to figure it out. You're going to have to image these folks to figure it out. I mean, if you see it on physical exam, you're going to be like, yeah, yeah, thank you. For far as these, we need to go get this looked at with the imaging. So, but just know. This is important if you were actually, uh, if you worked in interventional radiology, or if you were in CARDS, and you had to go in and do the dye studies and the philoscopy, they would be like, where, what, what is this blockage at right here? You would have to know, okay, that's proper too, or that's the, you know what I mean? That's where this comes into play. So history, again, this is subjective. This is your HPI development. This is your, what the patient is telling you. Um, it can be asymptomatic. So then you're probably like, well, why are they in my office? <laughs> Maybe they're there just to establish care with you. Maybe they're there to get some blood pressure medicine refilled. Who knows? Um, the asymptomatic component is important to know that. Let's say you have a dude in there, first time ever establishing care with you, he has tons of risk factors. You would want to think, you know, I should probably do an ABI on this dude. He's over the age of 50, he's a diabetic, he's overweight, he has a lot of smokes, hyperlipidemia. I'm going to do an ABI, make sure you don't have PAD. You may not even know he has it. Um, so that's, that's what that means. But if they have this. Here are some of the symptoms. So this is that whole claudication thing. 
Leg claudication, remember we're talking about that. I know we already did the jaw business. But claudication is the biggie for these folks. It's intermittent. It can be in their butt cheek. It can be in their thigh, their hip, the calf, feet, anywhere, obviously, ear down. They can say, man, my, I walk to the mailbox, it's 20 steps, and by the time I get to the mailbox, my butt cheek is just killing me. I sit there for a couple of minutes, it goes away. I take a couple of steps, I'm good. But as soon as I get back those 20 steps back to my front door, the butt pain is coming right back. That is intermittent progression. It goes away when you rest. And that's all that saying there. Um, leg pain worse when patient raises the leg, improves when patient lowers the leg. This has somewhat to do with gravity, obviously. Um, because when they raise it, that blood may not be there even more. Because if it's already included and they go to raise it, it's going to, gravity just takes it more away. Anyway, these are just little telltale things. The third bullet point, this is really interesting. And any time I have a man that comes in with erectile dysfunction issues, I always go down this road. People will just overlook it. They'll be like, oh, here's the Viagra, let's just call it a day. I always talk to them about arterial disease because the blood that feeds into the penis comes from those areas and they can actually have blockage causing the <coughs> Bless you, sir. Specifically, the internal healing act. So, if you ever have to work a gentleman up for uh, issues with um, erection, have this on your differential, especially if they have any of those risk factors like diabetes is another one, hyperlipidemia, obese, smoking. Think about this. Um, and that may be their main complaint. Is they come in just for that? Leg, foot weakness, because again, like I've said a thousand times today, if you're decreasing blood to anything, eventually that nerve and that muscle is not going to do what it's supposed to do. And they're going to have leg weakness. None of this tingling, skin changes, um, and that's the extra little lecture that I threw in there for you. They will eventually start to have dermatological skin changes that are consistent with arterial disease. Because with these folks, you know, um, Things eventually die when it's not getting blood. The heart, the brain, whatever. In this case, just like our skin, it's supplied by blood, right? Well, you're cutting that blood flow off. So that skin that's superficial will start to break down and die. These folks get ulcerations. These are the folks that get gangrene when they have. This is a little bit different. I mean, it's somewhat the same. The diabetic foot, when people say diabetic foot ulcer, diabetic foot. They're talking about, it's actually kind of overlap, but they're mainly talking about because when you have horrible diabetes, you have just neuropathy, you don't feel anything in your foot. So these people go and step on a nail, they have no idea it causes breakdown. But these folks are because they are basically no blood to their skin. So their, their skin's dying. <clears throat> it can be pretty gnarly. We've already talked about this. Physical exams, so these are some of the things that you could potentially be seeing on physical exam. So this is going to be in your objective part. You can obviously put this, uh, and I think I told you guys this other day, you can put this in your skin or your derm section, but you can also put this in your card section. Or you can have your own section in your objective that's peripheral vascular. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So skin pallor, when the leg is elevated above the level of the heart, Dependent rhubarb, that is, and there's a picture of it in that lecture I gave. That's basically when they hang their legs over, it becomes kind of dusty, husky, red looking. Dry, shiny skin, cornell growth, they can't have ulcerations, getting green, toe ischemia, hair loss. This is why we need to look on those little review systems. Uh, I'm sorry, on your general, under that first of your peripheral vascular exam, hair loss. <clears throat> because eventually they start to lose their hair because they have no blood supply. Weaker absent pulses, that's something you'd obviously document. Muscle atrophy and then bruise. So if there's any kind of blockage in this neck of the woods, you know, when you make you listen there, you hear that because of the flow. You would want to document that. And that's why we make you also take those areas. 
Here's just some pictures. You can look at those. Same pictures that are in that, if you open that other lecture, there's tons of pictures and why you can differentiate between Venus. I know Dr. Obama was doing your Venus stuff, so you may have already went through that. There are, there are different classification systems. There's all, you know, we love classification systems in medicine. There are three for this, um, Fontaine Stage, Rutherford Category, and the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. Um, the one that I used when I was in, uh, as a student and did practicing family medicine was number one, the Fontaine Stages. Those are the ones that I felt like I kind of understood them. Like I could get that. I could do that, do an assessment, and give them a stage that I wasn't too horribly far off from. You don't have to do these as a primary care PA, but it does help whenever you go to refer that patient to cardiology or vascular. There are vascular doctors you can send patients to. It's good to have that in their chart. At least you try to get it. Obviously, stage three and four somewhat, you know, you're getting more severe though. So stage three is I'm having pain even when I'm just sitting there chilling out. That's not good. Kind of like your stable one, stable stuff. Remember that for your angina? I think it's better with rest chest pain versus <coughs> no, it's still there even when I'm chilling out. That's kind of what they're saying in three. And then four is, of course, if you're seeing those changes in the dark of the skin, the ulcers, the gangrene, the skin. Um, honestly, man, you could work these people up to the nines. There are some basics that I would do. I honestly would probably, if it was a new patient, never been seen, they told me they had a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, I'd get everything. I would do a CBC, I would do a CMP, I would do a lipid panel, fasting lipid panel, and I would definitely get a hemoglobin I would see on them. For sure. Um, I think that's a good basic startup. You can check for anemia, you can make sure the renal function's okay, just in case you put them on some type of medication that may need that uh, play into it. Uh, hemoglobin I would say, obviously that's risk factor diabetes, and then lipid panel, because that's a biggie, right? I mean, if they have high, you know, through the triglycerides, cholesterol, you've got to get those under control. Because that sticky fat is not going to help. That's what's causing the sclerosis. <coughs> there are different imagings that you can use for this. Um, duplex, this is the site, the color flow that I had told you guys about earlier. Basically, they take them in, um, they can put it on there, see blood flow back and forth. As where the contrast angiography, that's where they actually go in and do fluoroscopy, and they sit there and watch it. They, and I got a picture here. That's where they shoot it in, and they actually can look real time where the actual blockage may be. There's arrows there where that you can actually see a little pink. You can get right up to your screen and see it. Um, a cardiologist that I rotated with when I was a student this is what he did. I would sit there with him and they'd shoot the dye then he'd go in and put a stent in. And I know you can't see, it's not, sometimes it's gone. Like there'll be a blockage and there'll be absolutely no artery. Like it's just complete occlusion. Um, so this again is where your anatomy, so if you're on cars and someone tries to pimp you, you better know like, oh yeah, that's a popliteal or that's, you gotta know that. But that is doing the contrast when they shoot it in and watch. <clears throat> ABI, um, you can look at it, it's in that slide. You do need to read about that and figure out how to do it. It's extremely easy. You're essentially going to be taking six blood pressure measurements, right and left. So you do dut, dut, for salus P is posterior tibial, for salus P is posterior tibial, for five, six, for systolic upper arm. And you do calculations and it spits out a number. It's extremely easy to do. And again, it's in that slide, you're going to need to go to your the gallons to look at a little bit more if that's, that's a quick one you can do. Non-expensive, no radiation, takes two seconds. The only thing I didn't say this earlier that you need to be able to do that one is you need a little handheld Doppler ultrasound. Because when you go to put the cup on the ankle, you stick the, you want to record systolic the first time, you know, you're looking at the blood pressure cup as it, if the uh, dial is going down. But the actual ultrasound, when you first hear that first boom, come back on the ultrasound. That's how you do it. <coughs> Those are some other things that you can also do. 
that's a YouTube video to the ABI. You're more than welcome to click on it and watch it. I would absolutely know how to do that. So again, what I said earlier, lifestyle changes, lifestyle changes for this. That's the big thing with this. You can give people meds all day long, but if they're still smoking and their diet is horrible, they're not working out, how are you going to, you know, the medicine's going to not do anything for them. So at least try to get some of those risky behaviors under control and treat any comorbidities that they have. So diabetes, get it under control. High blood pressure, get it under control. Hyperlipidemia, get it under control. <coughs> and that's essentially what we're going to say. They do have to start on an exercise program. I mean, we're not talking like, you know, go run 10 miles a day. It can be the basic of the basic of the basic. Anything's better than nothing for some of these folks. Now, granted, they may have that pain, so you have to start really low with these guys. I mean, I've seen it where they do 15 minutes, 10 minutes. For some folks, that's more than they've done in a long time. Foot care, appropriate shoes is really important for these guys because um, they already have that skin breakdown because of their uh, arterial insufficiency. So make sure you send them to, and there are referrals for people to get fitted for shoes, to have appropriate shoes for their feet. And you can actually refer them to uh, nutrition, and you can also refer them to um, people to help them with an exercise program. All those referrals are available. Now their insurance is different in what's covered and what's not covered, but just utilize your community, your resources that you can to help these people. Because again, these lifestyle changes are a thousand times harder than the, you know, taking a pill to get rid of something. It's the hardest thing to do. I mean, we've all been there. There is something called a qualification exercise <coughs> rehab program. Bless you. And again, you can refer them for this. There is referrals for physical therapy. It's just a physical therapy referral. They will actually do this and help them with this. So that would be your referral avenue is physical therapy. <clears throat> there are pharmacal therapeutic treatments that you can do. Again, I know you've already been introduced to a lot of these. Um, Antiplatelet anti therapy, clopidogrel, um, that's the big one that I know worked in at family medicine. There are other ones. That's the one that I, I, I use the most or knew about. Um, but there are other ones that you can do. And then, of course, you want to start on something to lower their limits. Those are some other ones you can read about. If it's bad enough, if they have so much blockage, um, whether it's on that stage three or that stage four of the fontaine that I showed you earlier, you're going to have to go in and surgically manage them. Uh, no amount of pill or diet or it's going to get it. You know what I mean? Especially if they have any kind of compromise to that one because of the blockage. Um, there are some of the reasons why you would do it. So there is bypass surgery, so literally what it means, you're bypassing around that blockage, making a new pipeline, so to speak. Or revascularization, and that is uh, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty. This is the gentleman that I watched, uh, the interventional cardiologist. He did stent placements. That's what he did. He would actually go in and right there, shoot them, pull the dice, see the blockage, and they would, he would bring up his things. Have you ever seen that done? It is unbelievable. They would just run this long wire in. I know, we all fly with it. Um, <laughs> and at the end of the wire is this teensy tiny little wire basket. And they just go to find wherever that, by that picture, wherever that blockage is at. They just go stick it up in there. And they stick it in and it just pops it open. I shoot. Thank you. They shoot, die again. You go around to the back because it's high amounts of radiation. I remember the cardiologist was like, because you have to wear lead. You have to put like a lead around your throat, red lead around your chest, because he's like, your ovaries are going to fly. So try to, yeah. I mean, it's, so as a student, I was like, God dang, I haven't had any kids, man. I've got to get back there. And, <laughs> so, but then you, it's, I'm serious, you'll have to wear the lead. And then they shoot the dot, and they see it go through. It magically goes through the lead. So, I mean, it's more complicated. That's essentially what they're doing. It's really cool. You can YouTube the videos. It's neat. There are different types of bypass. You can look at that. Um, depends on where you're actually trying to bypass. Essentially, it's just a graft. They go in and they put a new one in. Kind of like, you know, a heart bypass. Yeah, cabbage, when they do it in the heart. Same thing, same concept. 
There are complications to it, just like anything you put into the body. Massive bleeding, I would think so. <laughs> um, angioplasty, again, you can just read it. It's, again, percutaneous. It's where they go in and stick it in and open it up. There's the little basket. That's the little wire thing I was telling you tonight that the guy would run up in there. And they just pop it open. It's really cool. You see how that's somewhat occluded in the left? Not completely, but you can see it, and then they go and put it in, and you have, you can see where it starts in A. See at the very top, I know looking at this is bad, but if you had your computer, you could see it. It's just almost completely not there. And then in B, you have full investors. So that's pretty amazing. It takes no time to do it. Complications. You mean at the same time or like over a course? Like if they put one in, at, like in that example, how you have kind of decreased, it, it's obvious where it's occluded at the top, but there's decreased blood flow lower based on the after picture. So like if they put it up at the top and it wasn't normal below, would they go further? Well, they'll go to wherever it's occluded still, because if it branches, the main pipeline should hopefully be open. If they did, it wouldn't if it's not good. But if it occludes somewhere else, they'll go into that, wherever that contributory is, and they'll put it there. So, yeah. Okay. These are just referrals I always like to write out for students because, again, you don't know the stuff. You can refer people to everything known to me. Vascular. There's actually vascular referrals. Just send them to a vascular doctor. If you don't want to deal with cards, send them to vascular. Not that cards are bad. <laughs> Screening. You can read that. This is just saying that whole asymptomatic. You had a dude that came in your office first time, didn't know him, got to get some history from him, he found out he had some risk factors. What they're basically saying is, um, you're 50 and older, you want to just go ahead and do an ABI on them, no matter what. Just do it. Then you can document that. If they were normal, awesome. But if they were low, then you'd be like, hey man, you didn't even know this, but I just did some little test on you, and it's kind of indicative for atherosclerotic changes in your low extremities, and you have a low number, so that's something we need to look up. Um, or if you get it, it's cool, good number. At least you have a baseline, so then you could monitor that ABI. But that's essentially what that, that they're saying there. Certain high-risk groups. I would not write a test question over this, but you do need to, you need to understand that. And again, that other lecture is just skin changes. After you get trauma, you can look at our stuff and kind of say, I understand vein changes, I understand arterial changes, because they're different. If you have any questions over that, absolutely come find me, get me, you know where to find me. That's it, guys. Have a good day. Thanks for <laughs>